بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to this new episode of Ask Huda where I'll try my level best to answer the questions that I have answers for and before we receive your uh, uh, calls I'd request five to seven minutes just to go through some of the emails that I have pending and inshallah uh, after that we will take uh, your calls so if you're calling long distance don't call now just give it five or six minutes so that you would save a little bit of money a brother who's uh, anonymous he did not put his name he says I'm a big sinner and I have committed many major sins such as fornication many times missed many fart prayers and did not fast many days of Ramadan also lied, gossiped, and I'm very scared, how should I repent? What if I die now uh, uh, or one of these days? Please help me. First of all, 80% of your repentance has been already fulfilled, alhamdulillah. The Prophet says in an authentic hadith, remorse is repentance. So if you have this nadam, this remorse, this guilt, and you regret what you had done, this is a big portion of your repentance, inshallah, accepted. Now, what remains is that you have to quit doing these sins. And the sins are divided into two types. Sins that are between you and Allah Azza wa Jal. Watching pornography, uh, drinking alcohol, doing things such as not praying on time or missing prayers altogether, um, not fasting Ramadan. These are between you and Allah Azza wa Jal. The people are not harmed by these things generally speaking. Now, there are other sins that are between you and other individuals. So what's between you and Allah Azza wa Jal, you have to, first of all, uh, quit these sins, feel remorse, intend not to do these sins again. So if you do these three, keep in mind that you have the intention to do it sincerely for the sake of Allah and that you do it before you die or you, before uh, the sun rises from the uh, uh, from the West, if this is fulfilled, Allah will accept your repentance. The problem is that what about the sins that are between me and the other people, other individuals? If you have taken something from them, you have to return it back. If you have gossip, lied, uh, uh, you did backbiting uh, towards them, you have to seek their forgiveness. If this is possible, if it's not possible, if doing so would put you in more trouble, or would harm you, or face uh, going to jail, or be prosecuted. In this case, if you don't find any means of getting back what is lawfully theirs, you may take that and you may spend it in means of charity while seeking Allah's forgiveness uh, uh, as well. So if you manage to do this, then Allah Azza wa Jal would uh, uh, forgive your sins. As for the missed prayers, they're gone. You cannot make up for these missed prayers. However, you can offer voluntary prayers, night prayer, sunnah prayer, whatever, whatever you are free, you would like to pray and offer voluntary prayers. This is also uh, good, inshallah. Ma'roof asks and says, I have a plaster on my face and I do wudu and it does not wash the wound behind the plaster, which is really uh, isn't uh, uh, fatal. Will my wudu count? First of all, you either can remove the plaster and wash the wound, or you cannot because if you do this, you would delay uh, its cure and healing, and it may uh, uh, have complications and may get, get worse. If it's possible to remove and wash without any uh, complications, alhamdulillah, you must wash that area. But if not, as in the case if you have a cast on your hand, it's, uh, your arm is broken, and you have a cast and you cannot every single time you want to pray, remove it and then put it back again. So if you have a plaster in your face or on any 
part of the body that you must wash during wudu and the doctor says or you feel that if you remove it and wash it it would deteriorate and you would have complications and it would become worse or the healing process would take longer in this case alhamdulillah you wash the whole area you wash your face except to that area with with the plaster and then you wipe over the plaster better more if the plaster is waterproof then you can wash your whole face without any problem there is no need to remove it because of uh, the harm that would be caused afterwards Abdu, abdul mu'tasim i think and mu'tasim is not one of allah's name so the name should be revised he says my question is suppose one can't do sajda on the ground while salah and usually he keeps a small chair in front of him and does the sujood on it is it permissible the answer is no if you're unable to put your forehead on the ground then there is no need to bring a pillow or a table or a chair so that you can put your head on it or your forehead on it this is not permissible and it's an innovation what you should do is when you perform rukur you do this if you cannot do proper rukur so you kneel uh, a little bit forward you bow a little bit forward and for your sujood you go a little bit further and this is what you must do muhammad says that can an animal be slaughtered by a non-muslim in the rip, in the presence of a muslim who says bismillah before the animal is slaughtered but the one who slaughters is non-muslim you have to explain this non-muslim is what what religion does he follow as muslims we cannot eat any animal that is slaughtered unless the person slaughtering it is a muslim a jew or a christian so if you get any other religion to slaughter for you this is a dead meat you cannot eat it even if he says allah bismillah allah akbar and recite surah al-fatiha and surah al-baqarah as well doesn't change a thing because we are only allowed to eat one of these three people's slaughtering muslims jews or christians so these animals that they slaughter we can eat from it providing that they say bismillah allah akbar and if a person is in the presence of um a buddhist for example and the buddhist is slaughtering and they don't slaughter usually it's against their religion but hypothetically and you say bismillah 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 and he slaughters this doesn't count the person who's slaughtering should say this now the jews and christians we don't hear them say bismillah well this is sufficient as long as we do not hear them say in the name of jesus in the name of the holy cross in the name of the holy sea or the holy ocean or the holy river no, if, as long as they we do not hear them say these things then their slaughtering is permissible as long as you don't mention any other than the name of allah azza wa jal the last question is uh, rafia's question if i uh, she's she's a female she's talking about herself if i breast uh, feed a girl uh, that is a baby an infant will she become mahram for my husband son father and brother and what are the obligations upon her suckling or breastfeeding is one of the ways that a person becomes a mahram to that woman who breastfed him she becomes his mother through breastfeeding and all those related to her become related to him because he is now her son providing that the suckling takes place within two years of his uh, uh, life if he exceeds two years of age then the suckling is not counted and that he suckles five meals and if this happens if a woman suckles a, a, a baby girl who is like 10 months old and she feeds her five meals five times in this case uh, she becomes her daughter and her husband the woman's hu uh, uh, husband becomes her father through suckling and the brothers of the woman becomes her uncles and the uh, 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 the sons of the woman from previous marriages or coming marriages become the brothers of this baby girl what are the obligations upon her to be kind and to be uh, to honor them but it it is nothing close to a biological woman a real uh, uh, let me well let me rephrase that it is nothing close to a biological mother because the rights of a mother are far exceeding the rights of a suckling uh, uh, mother even if that suckling mother 
brought her up and was kind to her and took care of her, still she is not related to her through blood, but rather through suckling. So what are the uh, obligations? Of course, she uh, becomes a mahram. Uh, she can travel with the relatives of that suckling woman, uh, the husband or uh, her brothers through suckling, uh, etc. But there are no relationship in terms of, um, for example, inheritance. She cannot be inherit. Uh, and she cannot inherit that woman or her relatives. She um, also is not obliged to obey and respect her as she does with her original parents. Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. We have calls. Atif from Saudi. Yes. Um, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam. Um, yes, I have uh, two questions. Yes, brother. Uh, the first one is um, uh, my mother wants to travel from uh, Saudi Arabia back to our country, Pakistan. Um, the question is, if uh, and can she uh, travel alone, or she will require mahram any for this travel? Any this more questions? Question. Second question. The second question. Yeah, the second question is regarding the memorization of Quran. You know, it happens that sometimes in the childhood, yeah, I mean, the, the child memorizes the Quran, and then later on, because he gets so much busy in the world, uh, that he forgets the Quran. So I heard many people, many scholars saying that, um, actually, few scholars saying that um, that there is no salvation for such a child who forgets the Quran unless he, you know, rememorizes it. Um, the second part of the same question is that uh, if the person forgets the memorization. Now, and he really wants to learn and understand Islam, you know, by, by studying or doing some uh, courses. So what is beneficial for him either do the rem rememorization or to uh, really understand Islam? So what should be his priority? Okay. So, yeah. I will ask you a question, inshallah. Uh, Omar from Pakistan. I think we lost brother Omar, I hope. Uh, Omar? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam, akhi. Sheikh, how are you? I'm fine. Alhamdulillah. Zakallah, Sheikh. Sheikh, I want to ask a question. Yes. Uh, two questions. Uh, first question is regarding uh, the position of the finger in the tashad. Uh, that we have, do we have to bend our uh, finger? I, I heard that this hadith regarding the, to, to bend the finger in tashad is weak. Okay. So what is the ruling on it? And second question is, uh, Regarding the traveling, uh, I mean, uh, how 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 should we pray uh, during traveling? I mean, I'm in the train, and the uh, journey is about uh, 14 to 15 hours. So uh, how, how I, I mean, uh, I I want I should pray kasr or uh, complete prayer. Okay. During this. And uh, during your flight, you mean? D during during traveling in train, yeah, train. Okay, okay, in train, okay. Yeah. I will During this time, uh, should, should I have to pray asr or complete? Okay, I will answer your question, inshallah. Okay, jazakallah. Alaykum salam. Abdullah from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Wa rahmatullah. Good evening to you, akhi. What can I do for you? Yes, sir, I have three, yes, I have three questions. The first one is regarding the issue of arriya, show off. Okay. Um, sometimes when you are performing uh, you know, an act of worship, it is very difficult. It's very, very difficult for you to continue on what you are doing when somebody is watching or maybe when the process of doing it, then maybe you are praying and somebody enters the mosque. But you try as much as possible to push it out of your mind that you are doing this regularly and you don't want the presence of somebody to affect what you are doing. So I don't know, is that thing in your mind that keeps, you know, affecting your prayer, is it? You know, does okay. it affect your... Yes. Okay. And the second question is regarding the issue of um, the memorization of the Holy Quran, just like the first brother said. Okay. I had an ulama yesterday saying that, uh, and a Muslim actually saying that uh, the person that memorizes the Quran and does not wake up at night to recite it is going to be affected by the punishment of the grave. How true is that? Okay. And the third question is regarding the Rasulullah Is it true that he is, um, he, he cannot read and write? Is it true? Okay. Because I had somebody saying something like that. Thank you. You are welcome. Saba from Canada. 
السلام علیکم وعلیکم السلام و رحمت الله شیخ آقا تو پرسشن مای فرس پرسشن ایز that uh, uh, in, uh, please advise, advise me what we should do. Uh, we know that uh, there is a marriage proposal between two people. Uh, one is our family member, the boy is our family member, and the girl belongs to one of our friends. Now, uh, nobody has asked us any information regarding the boy. But the thing is, the boy is, uh, is a good boy. He is obedient to his parents and everything, but he is not very honest in his business practices. So should we on our own go and tell the girl's family or should we be quiet and wait till somebody asks? Because he is a good person but his business practices are not at all honest when it comes to money. Okay. And my second question is, I have a habit of reading the Quran early in the morning after Fajr. But it, uh, as soon as the uh, Azan is there, I finish my Salah and then read the Quran. But before the sun rises, um, I have to go to leave my children uh, 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 to, this, to their school. So what happens is when the sajda of the Quran comes, I cannot do because I just finished my Fajr Salah. So should I do that sajda because the sun has not risen yet? So please advise me what I should do. Okay, I will. And my, my, it's not a question, uh, Sheikh. There is something that I would like to ask you, but I can't ask over the air. So is it possible that I could get your number where I could ask you privately? Okay, the brother's in the control. Please give her my uh, mobile number if you can. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. Wa jazakallah. Alaykum. Alaykum salam. Okay. Asma from Dubai. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, uh, I want to ask you, but uh, is the... Uh, Leasing your house or um, leasing your house, is it halal, sir? Leasing it to someone else? Yeah, to someone else. They are giving us a uh, lump sum amount for one year or two year agreement. Then after that, they are using that house during this time. After that, we have to return it back to them after two years like that. Return, return the money to them? We have to give the amount back to them after the agreement is finished. Okay. So during this time, they are using our house. Yeah, this is... Okay, I will answer, answer inshallah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, the, uh, we, I will answer the question, inshallah. Okay, uh, bear with me, give me like seven to ten minutes and I'll answer your questions, inshallah. Question number one from Brother Atif from Saudi Arabia. He's asking, is it permissible for my mother to travel from Saudi Arabia back to our home country? And the answer is no. This is not permissible unless she has a mahram. And this is the fatwa of the Prophet, والسلام, who said, it is not permissible for a woman uh, uh, who believes in Allah on the Day of Judgment to travel without a mahram. And he did not specify whether she is old or young, beautiful, or ugly, uh, alone, or with uh, a trustworthy companionship of women. So she has to have a mahram. Question number two, uh, he says that he heard some in his locality, some scholars say that if a child memorizes the Quran and forgets it after a while, then this uh, child will not be uh, uh, saved. Uh, there's no salvation for him. And this is not correct. The issue of memorizing the Quran and then forgetting it, the scholars have different opinions uh, of that. And the most authentic opinion is that this is not a sin. The sin is that you read and learn an ayah and then you do not apply it. So you read the verses that condemn dealing with riba, with interest, and yet you still deposit your money in the bank and borrow or finance your business with interest. Then this is someone who is committing a major sin, not because he forgot the ayah, but because he did not apply it and implement it in his life. And uh, 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 saying that a, a child is condemned for that and he would not be salvaged, uh, he, he, there's no salvation for him, that is... Uh, on the Day of Judgment, this is not correct at all. A child is not burdened by what he has done in his youth before reaching the uh, uh, age of puberty. The third question is, if a person wants to rememorize the Qur'an, what is best for him? To do so or to practice and learn uh, other things uh, of his religion, such as fiqh or aqidah? They go side by side. Akhi. You cannot say, no, I'm going to devote... 24-7 of my life to memorizing the Quran. This is not practical. 
time has to be, to be divided and you have to acquire what is more important. If you have a company that you would like to establish and you would like to trade and sell and buy, then memorizing the Quran should be uh, delayed a little bit and you should acquire the knowledge that governs uh, commerce and transactions. If you're going for Hajj and you don't know the rituals and how to perform and what the do's and the don'ts, then in this case you have to delay uh, and postpone it a bit so that you could master the thing that you're going to do. So they go side by side, inshallah. Brother uh, from Pakistan, Umar, yes. Brother uh, uh, Umar says, uh, regarding bending the, uh, the finger like so, so uh, when in the tashahud, there are two forms. Either you make a fist and point the index finger throughout the tashahud when you're sitting, or you make a circle with your middle finger and your thumb and do so. Bending the finger, I don't have knowledge at the moment whether the hadith is weak or not. But this is what I've been practicing for so long. And this is a technicality that yani, maybe it is not our first priority, but you have all the right to ask this question. If you're kind enough to post your question on my website, in three, four days, inshallah, you'll get an email with uh, uh, the answer, inshallah. His second question was, if I'm traveling for 14 or 15 hours uh, nowadays, whether on a train, if you're going to Australia, Aussie, 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 um, 14 hours, 15 hours, what to do? How do I pray? Do I complete? No, definitely you do not complete your prayer. The sunnah and what is highly recommended for you is to pray, shorten your prayers that are four rakats into two. So you pray Asr, uh, Dhuhr, Asr, and Isha. Instead of four, you pray them two. Whether to join or not, it is best to pray on time. But if you would like to join, there is no problem in that. Abdullah from Nigeria says that whenever I pray in the masjid, I get this feeling of boasting and showing off. And, Akhi, this is everybody's problem. We're all in the same boat. However, the more you struggle with it and fight it, the sooner you will get, inshallah, to uh, uh, a conclusion and to safety. Because this is where shaitan works best. He comes to you. So he says, ah, you're prolonging your prayer because people are watching. He said, maybe. What to do? He said, shorten it. Make it quick. Be hasty in it. So you make it quick and you lose the reward of the prayer. You heard his advice and you did not perfect your prayer. So what to do? When he comes to say this to you, say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem. I seek refuge in Allah from the outcast uh, uh, shaitan. And fix and mend your intention. So yes, maybe I did intend to prolong it so that people would not see me pray fast in a fast way. But now I'm going to change my intention and I'm going to pray slowly with concentration and submissiveness for the sake of Allah, not for anybody else. So by this, you would hit two birds with one stone. You would uh, um, seek refuge in Allah from the shaitan and you may, would depress him and make him sad because you're not listening to him. And at the same time, you would obey Allah the Almighty. Also, he uh, says that similar to Umar's question, that they say in his country that those who memorize the Quran and do not pray night prayer, do not offer Qiyam al-Layl, they will be punished. And this is completely incorrect. What a person would be punished for is if he sleeps over mandatory prayers, such as Isha. So a person prays Maghrib and he stays late until 11, 12 o'clock and then he falls asleep without praying Isha. Then this person would be punished because he overslept. Though he has a Quran and he is listening to the Quran as, uh, uh, and memorizing the Quran as well. The third question he's asking, was the Prophet ﷺ illiterate? And the answer is yes, definitely. It's a consensus of scholars that the Prophet ﷺ did not know how to read nor write. Allah Azza wa says in the Quran that you did not recite the Quran before we gave you this revelation. When you were 40 years of age, before that, for 40 years, nothing of this sort of knowledge that you have brought after the revelation, nothing appeared on you. And you did not even write it with your right hand. So the Prophet, Allah is telling us that the Prophet had no prior knowledge before 
reaching the age of 40 and being revealed to, and that he did not write anything with, with his right hand, which means that he was illiterate. And there are other uh, verses of the Quran and also in the Hadith. So the Prophet, yes, was illiterate. Probably what would confuse people is that in the uh, uh, Battle of Al Hudaybiyah or the Treaty of the Hudaybiyah, when the Prophet was uh, uh, having a dialogue with the idol worshippers' representative, Suhail ibn Amr, may Allah be pleased with him, he was at the time a mushrik. The Prophet said to Ali, who was the writer of this treaty, he said, Write, this is what Muhammad, the Prophet of Allah, agreed upon with the Suhail ibn Amr, the representative of the idol worshippers. Suhail says, wait, if I knew that you were the Prophet of Allah, I would not had this, had this treaty with you. I would have admitted you to Mecca. So the Prophet said, okay, remove the word Prophet of Allah. This is what Muhammad, the Prophet of Allah, has agreed. She says, he says to Ali, uh, 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 scratch it out. And Ali said, by Allah, I will not do that. You are the Prophet of Allah and I will not cross it off, uh, uh, out. So the Prophet looked at it and he crossed it out himself. Some people said that, ah, the Prophet knew how to read and write. And this is no, no evidence at all. Any illiterate person, after signing and stamping his name, would be able to recognize his name. And so did the Prophet, والسلام, so his uh, crossing it out does not mean he can read and write, only that he can recognize his uh, uh, name, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Siba from Canada says that, I know two are getting married, Hopefully, there's a proposal. The boy is a good boy, but while in his transactions, he cheats when he sells and buys in his business. He's not very straight. So nobody asked me, should I go and, and, and tell them? In, to, to me, I believe that you should not, unless you are asked, because it is not something that affects the marriage directly. It affects, in general, the character of this person, but it does not affect the way he deals with his wife and the way he deals with his in-laws because usually this is a separate uh, situation. If asked, tell them that uh, in, in a nice way that yes, I know that he does business but his business uh, transactions are not uh, very legit. Um, she, her second question was the ruling on offering the prostration of recitation. I read an ayah and there is a prostration. And this is between Fajr time and before the sunrise. So am I allowed to do it? The answer is definitely yes. What you're not allowed, Sister uh, Siba, is to pray. You're not allowed to pray between, after Fajr and before sunrise. This is the restricted time for prayer. But to offer prostration of uh, uh, gratitude or to offer a prostration of recitation, these two prostrations are not prayers meaning that you don't have to be in the state of wudu to, uh, to perform them. You don't have to wear your hijab to perform them. It's not a prayer. Even you don't have to face the qibla to perform them. Though it is highly recommended to do so just to be in the safe side. So the answer to your question is yes, you're allowed to do this. Asma, and this is the last question we have. So if we have callers, uh, please take them in. Uh, Asma from Dubai says, and this is a normal or not a normal, it is a, a famous and popular transaction. It is me that I have a house and I need money. I need a loan. So someone comes to me and tells me, listen, I'll give you a million dirham. And I will live in your house for three years. After three years, you give me the million dirham back again. And I would consider this as a guarantee. This is clear riba. This is blunt and basic transaction of interest, which is one of the seven major sins in Islam. Why? Because the million dirham that you received in the beginning of the transaction or, or the contract, this is a loan. And you pay off this loan after three years back to your lender. And one says, okay, Alhamdulillah, it's interest fee. Where is the riba? The riba is giving the house to them to live for free for three years. This is the interest. 
And if you calculate it, you would probably come to find it is about 300,000 dirham. So this is the interest that they are collecting over their loan, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. We have a caller from uh, Sister Iman from Nigeria. Sister Iman, <laughs> wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Yes, sister. What is your question? I have four questions. Okay. It's okay, Darcy. Uh, okay. My first question is about, um, you know, I went to the park and then this dog came on and took my phone and took its mouth while there was data everywhere because I can't wash my phone and said I use air to clean it. Is this okay or? I am unable to uh-huh. hear you clearly, Sister Iman. The, 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 the connection is not very clear to me. So if you can call again, oh. inshallah, or try to explain what you're saying in, in a clear voice. Okay, Muhammad from Dubai. I think we've lost Sister yes. Iman. Yes, Muhammad, what can I do for you? Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, I want to know about uh, online trading. Okay, such as? Uh, now, there, is, uh, there are many financial institutions. Doing? They will give you a platform to buy and sell spot gold. Okay. You have to initially depos- deposit, uh, let's say, $5,000. Okay. So now you will see, you know, whatever there is going on in your screen, you just click a button and you buy the gold. It's like Forex? And you sell the gold. And is, is this haram or halal? Is it like Forex? It is, yeah, it is like a Forex. But eh? it is a commodity base. You, you buy gold or silver or platinum and you sell it another way. Okay. I will answer your but, question, but you, you do not you do not pay full amount of money. Example, of $5,000 is not sufficient to buy a lot of gold. But yeah. here it is possible. Okay. So I want to know if it's halal or haram. I will answer the question, inshallah. Any more questions? That's it. Thank okay, you. you're welcome. Sorry. Thank you, sir. Haya from uh, the Emirates. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam, Allah. Uh, I have two questions, if I may. Okay. Uh, the first one is that um, uh, my father has uh, collected a little bit of money in a bank in India, in one which there is uh, automatic uh, interest being given by the bank. And uh, I have told him a number of times whether we, that you should dispose it off. And um, it, it, he, he is taking his time and, uh, you know, I don't know why, but though he knows it is not correct to keep it, maybe he's looking for the right person or to give it to somebody needy and all. Can I, on his behalf, you know, without his knowledge, take it out and give it? I don't know whether I should be doing it. I'm really afraid for him. And uh, my second question is, uh, if we do not own any house or property, and uh, at least for the sake of one house, are we allowed to take a loan, uh, interest-based loan? Because in India, it, it is only possible to take a loan on interest. Nobody will give you an Islamic loan or uh, interest-free loan okay. for, uh, for a house. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Jazak. Okay. Fatma from the U.S., yeah, yes. Yes, what can I do for you, sis? Oh, uh, should I tell you my question? Yes, please. Okay, I have questions about uh, Ramadan that I did not fast years ago. Reason? Yeah, um, uh, it, was, it was difficult and we were not um, living in a house really. We fled from the country and went to another country. Okay. Second question? And Yeah, second question is, um, how, if you have a gold for this dressing, how, my, how many grams um, should I be Zeka or it doesn't matter the gram? It just has to be, even if it's five grams, you have to be Zeka. Okay. And how about, if you, yeah, how about if you don't have the money to be the Zeka? Okay. Any more oh, questions? Yeah. Any more and questions? And my third question is, mm. I have another third question. Okay. My third question is, like, if a um, husband has two wives, and can one of them ask his income, monthly income, to 
we divided half and half equally, both both wives. Uh, in, in in the time divorced. in the time of marriage or after divorcing him? Uh, in the time he's married to both of them. His monthly income is it okay if one of them says, you know, divide whatever you get a month half and half? Okay, and he he's, he's left with nothing. What? And he's left with nothing. If she takes half and, and the other one takes half, the poor husband has nothing. Yeah. Okay, I will answer the question, inshallah. <laughs> okay, okay, should I stay online? Uh, no, 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 I will answer your question, inshallah. Oh, you, you're going to answer the questions? Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, Iman, we've lost from Nigeria. Muhammad from Dubai. He's asking about online trading. What's your ruling on online trading? Online trading, if you are dealing with gold or silver or currency, is forbidden. Because one of the most important conditions in the permissibility of such transactions is that it is on the spot, meaning that I give and take at the same time. And these online tradings do not put and deposit the money instantly in your bank account. You have a bank account with them, for example, like the brother says, $5,000, and you buy and sell on the screen, but once a transaction happens, they deposit it in your virtual bank account with them, which you cannot claim except after two to three days. This is haram. If I have dollars and you have pounds, and we would like to exchange or sell and buy this has to be instantly meaning that this is a hundred I take 150 in exchange if I give you a hundred and say okay after one hour I'll come and collect uh, uh, my uh, money this is haram it has to be on the spot the second problem in online transaction is that they sell you by what they call margin so they say okay deposit five thousand dollars and we will triple that, meaning that we will give you the, the, the authority to buy and sell of $20,000. So $15,000 we're adding to your $5,000. And it's like gambling. You just, on the screen, it's red. I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll buy now. And at the end of the day, I will sell. But what happens if it keeps on plunging? Well, what happened is that you bought what is worth of 20000 and you only put 5000 the minute it reaches 17,000, this is 3,000 of yours and 2,000 remaining, they will block your transactions. And they will say that you've lost everything and they will take their 17,000. If you make profit, okay, no problem. They will share that with you. But the minute you come to their own assets, which is the 15,000 plus the margin they had given you, a thousand or two more, they will take that from you and this would make it double uh, jeopardy and it's haram. Uh, to deal in such things. Haya from the Emirates, she says that her father has accumulated interest money over a, uh, uh, an amount, an account that he has opened in a bank in India. Uh, he, has a deposited, he has deposited some money and the interest is accumulating. So she has warned him, she has advised him, and he's not listening. He's not that keen on giving it on the spot. Maybe he's looking for someone to give it to. She says that I have the authority, uh, I have the power to go to his bank account and take it without his permission and knowledge. Is this permissible? Nasser is no. This is something that he's accountable for and you don't have the right to go against his will and take it uh, because this would not exempt him from the sin. He has to do it himself. She says that, is it permissible just once? to borrow in riba, in interest, so that we can purchase uh, a plot or a land or a house to live in only once. We would like to make this major sin in our lives. Definitely the answer is no. It's like someone saying that, can I try wine only once? Can I fornicate only once? A sin is a sin. And what, some people, especially in Europe and India and elsewhere, think that it is permissible even to kill in order to get a house to live in. As if the family house, the property that you live, that you leave after your death is something sacred. And this is wrong. 
you could go on all your life paying rent and nothing would happen. So, yeah, Sheikh, how can I pay rent? I'm losing money. I want to. Yeah, you can live your whole life on rent. You can live your whole life without acquiring or owning a plot or a land or a, a, a villa or a building. There's nothing wrong in that. If you don't possess the money, you don't need to. It's like someone saying, yeah, Sheikh, I cannot drive this, these Japanese cars. I need to drive a fast uh, uh, racing car, a Ferrari or a Maserati or whatever. It's unfit, uh, not befitting for me to... Why? You can even walk on your feet and not borrow through riba because this is a major sin and you have to stay away from that. So the answer to you, uh, Sister Haya, is no, you cannot take a, an interspace loan for any reason, none whatsoever. Fatima from the USA had three questions. First question, she had a Ramadan that she did not fast due to tribulations and moving from one country to the other and f fleeing with their lives. What to do? You can make up for these uh, missed days now. And Allah Azza wa is most forgiving because you have a legitimate reason and you had a calamity that prevented you from uh, doing that. And the second question is, she has gold and she wears this gold. Now, does she have to pay zakat for it? The answer is the most authentic opinion of, of uh, uh, scholars is that if two conditions are fulfilled, you have to pay zakat for that gold, whether you wear it or you statch it and keep it for uh, uh, safekeeping. The first condition is that the gold reaches the weight of 85 grams or above and 85 grams of 24 karat gold, not of 14, 16, or whatever. So this, a goldsmith would be able to advise you. So if it's less than 85 grams, then there is no zakat, none whatsoever. The second condition is, if you have 85 grams or, or more, that a whole year passes and it is in your possession. So every year that is lunar year or Islamic year, you have to give zakat that is 2.5% if these two conditions are fulfilled. Abba from Nigeria. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa Yes. Doing, I'm fine. Hi, how can I do? Abba, what can I do for you? Uh, I have a question. The first question is um, during the Friday summer, Friday. Friday khutbah. Okay. Between the two khutbahs. What to say? What is the uh, prayers are we to okay. make or something like that? Second question. The second, the second question is, um, in a prayer, doing prayers, you know, normal prayers, congregation prayers or something like that, when the imam is the uh, bad, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Are we to say that sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in our heart or, you know, normally? Okay. Third question? Um, the third question. Normally, in prayers, is it only for takbir to the haram that we have to raise our hands or for all takbir? I did not get your question. I say in prayers, yes. is it only to take to the haram that we have to raise our hands and say Allah Akbar okay. with the own take Okay, I will answer your question. Uh, okay. Samia from Dubai. Samia from Dubai. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as-salam Yes, sir. So what's your question? Um, I have two questions. The first one is, um, you know about the horse meat scandal in, um, in Europe, right? So if um, horse is slaughtered according, you know, um, according to Islamic rights, is, is it halal or not? I, I, I didn't get your question. About horses? Yeah, can, we eat, can we eat horse meat okay, if okay, it's slaughtered okay. in the Islamic way? Okay. Second, second question? The second one is regarding brushes. Um, brushes can be used for makeup, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if these brushes are made from goat hair and the goat hasn't been slaughtered, can we use this? Can we use these makeup brushes? Okay. And um, uh, regarding brushes itself, 
Can we paint using brushes made from pig hair or goat hair? You know, painting on paper, just on paper. Okay. Can we use, that's it. Okay, I will answer your question, inshallah. Okay. Yunus from Ghana. Yes, yes. Yes, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Yeah, I want to ask a question um, about the Kaaba. I want to know there's a, a certain decision uh, that it was uh, a Prophet uh, Muhammad who built the Kaaba. Some say uh, it is uh, Adam who started the Kaaba. Some say it is uh, Abraham who started the Kaaba. I want to know who okay. didn't really start the building of the Kaaba. And then the second question is. Um, there is a certain thing going on in Africa, particularly. Okay. Some Muslims are using the Quran for for a business. Something, some, 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 maybe something like somebody needs something from Allah, from God, and then the the, the Malam will write the, some ayah to him and say that if he drink this ayah, he will get what he wants from God, and then. He requires money from him. So people are sitting on, in the room, particularly in Africa, and they are, they are doing business, giving them those things. So uh, if you drink it, you will get money from him. But is it good or is it good? Okay. I will answer the question, inshallah. Okay. Sheer from Saudi? Yeah. Bashir. Bashir. Yes, Wa alaikum as Bashir, bye. Yeah, I'm Bashir from Kansas. Yes, brother. What can I do for you? Yeah, I want to know this... Uh, Prophet Sallallahu said, my intercession will be for those among my ummah who committed major sins. Okay. Yeah, so one of my friends quote this hadith and he says that uh, uh, if I do not pray then also if I say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, I will be sent to Jannah. Okay. Because our Prophet will intercede on behalf of us. Okay. So please explain. I will, inshallah, qadr, inshallah. Okay. Okay. Fatima from the USA says that if a man has two wives, is it permissible for one of the wives to demand that his income is divided into two and he gives both wives uh, ha uh, this half and the other wife this half? The answer is no. She can demand whatever she wants, but a man is a man. At the end of the day, he should not do what his wives tell him to do without thinking of the consequences. Now, when it comes to financial issues, a lot of the sisters will hate me for this, but I do support the opinion that says a woman should not know the income of her husband. Because as long as he's providing for her, he's giving her allowance, he's buying what she wants, why, why does she want to know how much he earns? This would cause problems in the future, especially that some women are so demanding that if, if you earn 100,000, they would demand 105. It, it's this, this is their nature. Not all of women, of course. So I do uh, uh, recommend and advise the brothers not to tell their wives, not to tell anyone to begin with about their income. This is between you and you. Keep it this way. As long as you give them what they want, you don't have to tell anyone, uh, let alone dividing your income between your two wives so that they can uh, uh, compete against each other in buying clothes, fancy clothes and, and, and stuff like this. No. You give them allowance if you wish. This is not mandatory. Pocket money, it's up to you if you want to give. This is highly recommended if you do so that she would feel a little bit independent and you provide for them what they need from clothes and food and shelter, etc. Other than that, no, you don't have to do uh, what Sister Fatma is, is asking. Abba from Nigeria is saying that what does the Imam say and what is recommended to, to, to be said between the two uh, 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 speeches or orations during the Friday sermon? We know that the Imam gives the first khutbah, first sermon, and then he sits for a sh short pause and then he stands up and says the second uh, sermon. So what do we say in between on what does he say there isn't anything prescribed so you can ask Allah Azza wa Jal you make dua oh Allah pay my debts oh Allah uh, uh, give sense to my wives uh, more and more oh Allah guide my children 
or you can ask Allah for forgiveness and because the first sermon is usually concluded by I seek Allah for forgiveness for myself so ask Allah for forgiveness so when he sits down you say oh Allah forgive us oh Allah forgive me oh Allah uh, do this and that and there's nothing prescribed his uh, second question was that when the Imam in congregation recites a surah where the Prophet is mentioned for example Muhammadur Rasulullah do we say Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Muhammad do we offer salutation to the Prophet alayhi salatu salam the answer is no why because it, we were not commanded we were not um, advised and instructed to do so during prayer yes if I hear his name outside of the prayer I offer salutation a hundred times a thousand times during the day this is good but during prayer itself this is not recommended his third and last question what's the ruling on raising the hands when saying takbiratul ihram takbiratul ihram is the first takbir the first time you say takbir to inaugurate to initiate the prayer so when you say allahu akbar now this is takbiratul ihram he says do we raise our hands only once in the prayer and the answer is no you raise your hands four times in the prayer two times that are repeated in every rak'ah and two times that are only done once the two times that are only done once are takbiratul ihram you only say it once and the second is when you stand up from the first tashahud to the third rak'ah so this occurs only in maghrib or in four rak'ah prayers so after tashahud when i stand up for the third rak'ah i say allahu akbar and this takes place only once so these are two places that only takes once in a prayer the other two take place in every single rak'ah and there is that, that is when i want to bow to or move to the rukur position i say allahu akbar and i make rukur and when i raise my head from rukur saying sami allahu liman hamida i raise my hands and uh, these happen in every rak'ah samia from dubai says what's the ruling on eating horse meat if it is slaughtered Islamically, the answer it is halal. Asma bint Abi Bakr, may Allah be pleased with her and with his fa with with her father, the sister of Aisha. May Allah be pleased with them all. She said that we've slaughtered a a, 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 a horse at the time of the Prophet ﷺ and we ate its meat, so it's halal. And the scandal now found in uh, UK, I think, in the in the US, no, in the UK. Uh, where they found some lasagna and meatballs in, in South Africa as well because of horse meat. To us as Muslims, if this was slaughtered, this is halal and there's nothing wrong in eating it. Uh, second question, what is the ruling on applying makeup with brushes that have or are made from goat hair that was not slaughtered? This is halal because the hair has no effect such as the bone, uh, of an animal because it's dry and the horns of an animal because it's dry it is not moist as the flesh as the veins as the muscles etc so it is permissible for you to use this but I'd like to mention something though it is out of context that you should be careful for the sisters that apply the foundation the makeup and the eyelining and the lipsticks and the shadow and blah, 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 all these things you have to be careful because some of these substances are waterproof which means that once you apply them you cannot make wudu the, the, the water would not reach your skin and your wudu is invalid and your prayer is invalid so be careful if these substances have mass that would make a layer on your face on your lips on your eyes some of the mascaras that women apply is so thick that it prevents water from reaching uh, uh, the, in this case you have to avoid this and it's not permissible uh, using brushes to paint made of pig oil a uh, pig uh, hair i don't know if, if pigs have that long hair to make uh, uh, brushes but Hypothetically speaking, yes, this is permissible, though it is not recommended because we are Allah, we're supposed to avoid anything, everything that deals with uh, pigs. Uh, Bashir from Ghana, who built the Kaaba 
different uh, opinion of scholars, definitely it's not the Prophet, as I'm the Prophet, helped in rebuilding it after it was demolished. But the most famous opinion is Ibrahim and Ismail, peace be upon them, were the one who was to uh, uh, put the Kaaba on, back on his foundation. There is a famous uh, opinion that Adam was the first one to build it, but nothing is authentic. The most authentic is Ibrahim. Uh, using the Quran and writing papers and giving them to people and saying that if you give me like 100 uh, uh, euros, you will get what you wish. I'm in the wrong business if this is true. This is sorcery. This is, this is the acts of soothsayers and it's completely prohibited to abuse and humiliate the Quran in such a fashion and it's completely forbidden for you to believe that such a person by writing a verse of the Quran and giving it to you uh, through money that uh, you will get what you wish. And the last question from uh, Bashir uh, from Saudi Arabia. The hadith of my intercession is for those who commit uh, major sins. Uh, I do not recall whether the hadith is authentic or not. It's very famous. However, it does not mean that the Prophet is encouraging you, alayhi salam. The Prophet is opening a door for mercy, of mercy and a room of forgiveness for those who commit major sins. That don't despair as long as you repent, as long as you ask Allah for forgiveness, my intercession would be for you as well. To say that I will not pray, I will not fast, and I will believe in Allah and the Prophet, alayhi salam, and I will be entitled for the Prophet's intercession, this is ridiculous and whoever does this if your friend says that I will do this in this case tell him that yeah I think you have a good idea and that is why tonight I'm gonna come to your house I'm gonna take your money I'm gonna abuse your uh, family and I'm gonna smash your uh, uh, face and ask Allah Azza wa Jal that the Prophet would intercede for me this is ridiculous no one says that I will uh, 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 with my own mind and, and, and soul go and commit sin and depend on the Prophet's intercession or on Allah's mercy and the hell with everything else. This is ridiculous and it is unacceptable and Allah Azza wa knows best. This is all the time we have until we meet, we meet next time, same time. I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah is my heart's speech. Your mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deen allow me to advance. Help me in my quest, permit me to pass the ultimate test.